Today, we're going to learn how Twitch streams videos to millions of users in almost real time, why they migrated from Ruby to Golang, and how you can also build the live streaming experiences without going bankrupt. If you're new here, my name is Nicolas. I am a software developer living in Seoul, South Korea. I love building things and teaching others how to build them too. 여러분, 안녕하십니까? 저는 니콜라스라고 합니다. 너무 반갑습니다. In 2006, Justin Khan and his co-founders launched Justin TV as a 24-7 live stream of Justin's life. Then they expanded to allow anyone to create their own live streams across different categories. The gaming section of Justin TV became very popular, which led to the creation of Twitch TV as a spin-off platform, focused only on gaming content in 2011. Initially, Twitch was built on a monolithic architecture using Ruby on Rails. Monolithic means all parts of the application are interconnected and run as a single service. Monolithic architectures work very well for startups because they allow rapid development and iteration. But as Twitch exploded in popularity, the limitations of that architecture started to show. On Twitch, chat is everything. It's what makes watching fun. It is how streamers and viewers interact with each other. Without chat, Twitch is basically YouTube. Initially, Twitch ran the chat service well using eight machines. But as channels became bigger and gaming events became more popular, one big channel could slow down the whole machine, making the chat for other channels also slow down. And with all chats in eight machines, if one machine slows down, that means one eighth of all chats will suffer. Twitch tried fixing this by creating a separate chat service using Node.js, but hit a bug in Node.js core since bug was very young back then. They ended up creating the new chat service using a Python real-time framework called Tornado. In 2012, the version 1.0 of the Go programming language was released, and Twitch engineers wanted to see if it was ready for production. To test it out, they created a stress test tool in Go to push their systems to the limit. This experiment proved that Go was ready for production, and it also exposed bugs in the Python Tornado chat system. Their first Go program to run in production was the Message Exchange Server. It handled all Twitch messages with just 100 lines of code in a single thread. Then, a new service in charge of listing the top live streams in real time in the Twitch homepage called JAX was created and was built from the ground up using Go. They were loving Go at Twitch. So in 2015, they decided to rebuild everything using Go. A complete rewrite, crazy. They slowly took every endpoint of the Ruby on Rails API and rebuilt it as a Go microservice to slowly redirect traffic from the old server to the new Go microservices. In front of their backend API, they put an NGINX reverse proxy, which acted like a traffic cop. The job of this traffic cop was to slowly redirect traffic from the old code to the new code while checking if anything broke, until the traffic to the new code was 100%. What started in 2015 finished in late 2018, when finally the old servers stopped receiving traffic, and Twitch finally turned off all the EC2 instances in their AWS account. Microservices aren't the holy grail though, they increase the complexity of the system. Because we're in a monolith, you can import a file and call a method. With microservices, you need to make network call between services, which means you have to handle network data failures, load balances, latency issues, error handling, monitoring, logging, and more. They even ended up making a framework work for service communication written in Go called Twerp. They also rewrote their entire frontend from jQuery and Ember.js to a React app through 2017 and 2019. While all those migrations were happening, another team was working hard trying to make video streaming feel as real-time as possible. Video streaming is hard enough as it is, but low-latency video streaming is even harder. Low-latency means that streamers and viewers can interact in almost real-time. A stream that has a 30 to 50-second delay isn't as fun and interactive as a stream with 5-second latency or less. When you start a stream, that video does not go directly to Twitch servers. Instead, it is uploaded to one of Twitch's many points of presence or POPs. Then the video is uploaded from the POPs to Twitch's servers, also called the origin data centers. POPs are machines that Twitch deploys to the data centers of the ISPs or internet service providers all around the world. Those POPs are connected to Twitch's private network, also called a backbone network, which makes the upload happen way faster than if Twitch used the public internet to upload video. When the video arrives to the origin server, it is transcoded, a very computationally expensive task implemented using C, C++, and Go. 
Transcoding means converting the video to multiple formats and different quality levels, so it can be played by all kinds of devices in all kinds of connections. After the transcoding is done, the processed video in all its different formats and qualities is sent back to the POPs using the Backbone network. And from the POPs is where users from all around the world can download the video and watch it. Initially, there was only one origin data center in Silicon Valley that processed all video streams from all around the world. But now Twitch has origin servers in all countries. Continents. To handle the complexity that more servers bring to the table, they created IntelliJest and this is how it works. When a streamer uploads a video to the POP, it will first hit the IntelliJest Media Proxy program that runs in all POPs. IntelliJest Media Proxy will ask another program called IntelliJest Routing Service to what origin data center the stream should be sent for processing. To get this answer, IntelliJest Routing Service will ask Capacitor, another program, to see which data centers are online and healthy. And it will also use the Well, another program, to see if the backbone network and its links are available and can be used. Aware of what origins are online and not overloaded, and aware of the status of the backbone network, the routing service chooses the most optimal origin data center to process the video. This all runs in AWS. For solo developers or small startup teams that want to build something like Twitch video streaming, Twitter Spaces audio rooms, or Zoom-like video calling, the idea of having to deploy POPs and negotiate with ISPs worldwide can be depressing. This is why I want to give you a quick tutorial on how to use the new stream video and audio SDK that is absolutely free to use if you are a startup with less than five team members and less than $10,000 in monthly revenue. I made a video about streams chat SDK before back when I was in Mexico, where we saw how easy it was to clone something like Slack using streams pre-built UI real-time components. They now released a video and audio SDK that comes with pre-built UI components that we can use to build real-time audio and video experiences with almost no brain power. The SDK is available for React, iOS, Android, React Native, Flutter, JavaScript, and even Unity. Streams backend also runs in Golang, by the way. Here's how to replicate something like Twitch using Streams SDK. First, initialize the stream client using the API key and secret. Then register a user using only an ID and a name. This usually comes from your database. Then create a token using the user ID and initialize a call with a call type, where we can choose between default, which is a one-to-one -one or group call, audio room or live stream, and the name of our stream. Then create the call and say that it was created by our streamer user and call the go live method to make the stream public. Finally, get the RTMP URL of the stream and give it to the user along with the token. Then the streamer will copy and paste that URL and the token in their streaming software, whatever they use, and start streaming. To show that stream to other users using React and the pre-built components, all we have to do is import the components as well as some default CSS. Using an anonymous user, initialize the stream client and use the pre-made components to render the code. And that will give us a result like this. The UI is already built for us with the viewer counter, time, and full screen buttons. For other types of calls, we can use more of the pre-made components to add even more features, like showing the call participants, call control actions, change the call layout, permission notifications, reactions, permission requests, and more. It doesn't get easier than this. Sign up to stream and get a hundred dollars free usage credit every month by clicking the link below. Thank you for watching as always. Thank you to stream for sponsoring this video. And thank you to the Twitch engineers that wrote the five articles that I used as a source to make this video. Subscribe. Bye-bye.